stage. We need to do a sound check here in a second. They're going to start letting them in in, in, in about 10 minutes. We are here tonight to um, celebrate two things. Christmas, with a concert from my band, Texas Jazz Express. And to help celebrate Johnny Pate's 100th birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, now entering the room, Mr. Johnny Pate. I'm John. John W. Pate, Sr. They say I'm a hundred years old. As a young child, he was, he was raised by a mother and father that were divorced. And so he didn't have many birthday parties at all. So it was always my way of showing him my love. And so I would throw birthday parties for significant birthdays. I would have musicians and so forth and so on. And I kept getting calls from all over the country. What are you doing? What are you doing? And so I waited until the very end and I decided that it was better for us just to have the family. We then got a call from uh, Terry Pope, as you know, who is uh, a local jazz band leader here in town. And he asked if he could do a small tribute. So we decided, well, we would have the whole family come and we would have dinner there. We've had four generations that were there. He enjoys his family. That's the most important thing. He enjoys his kids and his grandkids. And so whenever they're around, that makes him feel good. And I think that was a tribute for his 100 year birthday, is to see all of them that were here. That really made him feel good. I did like the big band and uh, have uh, people really salute me like that. Uh, it was really flattering. so grateful to him for even wanting to acknowledge Johnny and to re to know that he remembered Johnny from years gone by. I was born in Chicago Heights, which is a little town about 28 miles south of Chicago proper. I guess it was just like any kid growing up. Um, my mother raised two boys without a father being there. One of the families that my mother worked for gave her an upright piano, and uh, they knew that she was raising two boys without a father being there. And uh, Mrs. Abbott gave my mother this piano. The church that my mother attended in Chicago Heights was a Baptist church. The choir director had to have a place to stay. And somehow, she ended up staying with my mother and my brother and I. This particular lady started teaching us piano. And that's when we found out that I had an, an exceptional ear for piano. Gotta be in the 1930s. This was during the days of jazz where you had Big bands like Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Louis Armstrong. That was the era that I grew up in. As I got further on in school, in junior high school, I ended up in a choir. When I was a freshman in high school, I had gotten interested in sports. And I went out for the basketball team so I'm doing basketball and I'm doing music. The bandmaster there needed tuba players because not too many kids want to go around toting a tuba. So by the time I reached my junior year, I was pretty uh, good on tuba as well as my singing, you know. And he kept me on that tuba through junior and senior 
because that's a, this is what he needed in his band. Now, the coach kept me playing basketball because he needed me for, to play basketball. I was a scrawny little thing, and my mother used to have to carry this tuba around for me. So here I am, my senior year, the bandmaster wants me, the coach wants me. Playing basketball was more to my liking than toting a tuba around. But yet and still, the taste for music was still there. I finished high school in 1942. And if you check your history books, World War II had started. I was drafted into the Army. I ended up going to an infantry training camp. The band that was stationed at this camp was an all-black band. And this bandmaster needed a tuba player. And not too many kids, especially black kids, wanted to play tuba. If I went for the infantry, I had to get up early in the morning, go out and train in all kind of weather, and I decided I'm going to go for this band thing. The 218th Army Ground Forces Band. You had to be able to read music, and that's all you did was play music. The band consisted of 38 members all different instruments, and you were taught to shoot a rifle, march. You were a soldier first and a musician second. If they needed you to fight, you had to put your instrument down and pick up a rifle and fight. And when you were not marching, you entertained the rest of the company that you were in. Uh, you had to parade, uh, you had to play for a dance maybe, and uh, these were, were things that went along with being a soldier, but you were in a band. And you stayed at the company while the rest of the guys who had been training got sent down to war. While in the Army, and I learned how to arrange a right music. I learned the different instruments. And I had learned how to write at that time, arrange music, orchestrate. I had learned how to conduct. And these were things that I picked up before I was discharged. So by the time I was discharged, I was well on my way to becoming a professional musician. When I was discharged, I began to look for a music school in Chicago. My main instrument was the upright bass. That was my main instrument. But it's by the same token, I could play jazz piano better than most jazz pianists around. So therefore I had two things to uh, uh, go by, you know. And being able to do that, play bass, play piano, and write, I could uh, pick up uh, you know, a few coins. And that's what really got me in, because I ended up uh, not playing much piano, but I ended up playing bass. That's where the trio came in. The Johnny Pay Trio came in, piano, bass, and drums. I began 
to look at it more like a business, you can make a good living at this if you handle it right. In Chicago, the Blue Note became the place where big bands would work and so forth. My name began to get out a little more as a bass player. I ended up with jobs with Duke Ellington. Singers would come in and they'd only be bringing maybe a piano player. And after they got here, they'd hire bass and drums. And that way I worked with Sarah Vaughan and Ella Fitzgerald, B.B. King. I'd be the first one to call. They had heard something that I did, and they liked what they heard, string-wise, and they wanted me to do the same kind of strings behind them on their next album, which happened to be an album called Life in a Tin Can, record companies. They began to call me to help produce the, uh, the album, and uh, this is how I got involved with record companies. Johnny and I met in late 1966, and it was just a chance meeting. I was out with a group of girls at one of the local, I don't know if you would call it a nightclub, but it was, it was a jazz club, and they also served dinner. And it was uh, wintertime in Chicago, so of course there was a blizzard. We needed a ride home. There were four girls, and he gave us a ride home. And that particular night, uh, I had just been dished by my current boyfriend, and so uh, I was kind of sad. <laughs> and so he gave us a ride home. Never saw him again. It was maybe a year later and um, ran into him again at a local jazz. This was a jazz club in Chicago called Club Delisa. And from that point on, we uh, started going out. He was always very well-dressed, extremely well-dressed. And he carried himself well, the quiet demeanor, which I liked. And um, he just seemed very um, confident, quiet but strong and uh, very sure of what he wanted in life and where he was going. And those are the things that I admire. And shortly thereafter, maybe another year or so. That's when the record company began to approach me and say, hey, you want to come to work for us? MGM had offered him a job in New York, so he had decided to go to New York. And he was still kind of trying to feel himself around and see where he wanted to be. I would fly up on the weekends, different things. He would come back and forth. Still dating, I got engaged to another guy. He flew back to Chicago immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, I didn't marry the other guy. And we just kind of stayed together. I decided I needed to change in my life because I was stagnant. I wasn't going anywhere and I had a brother that lived in the California area. I decided to relocate to LA. Unbeknownst to me, so had he. So we ended up back out there at the same time that we got together and then in 1970, we decided we would make it legal and we did. And here we are today, some 50 some years later and one son. So Johnny uh, was also doing Shaft in Africa at the time. Uh, that's the soundtrack I did. Isaac Hayes was uh, really doing the Shaft stuff. There was a guy at Capitol Records, uh, and he was one of the first guys that approached me to do arranging. Jay-Z and then Diddy and uh, Kid Rock all picked some of the same sections. And so we, Johnny was always very curious as to why that particular set interested them. 
you know, and, and I don't think we really got a complete answer from any of them. I guess that hook just just hooked them. When we met um, Jay-Z, Beyonce was there and her mother, Tina, was there. And I talked with them. She was pregnant with Blue Ivy at the time. And so we talked baby talk, even though my son was quite big by that time. He was Beyonce's age. But still, uh, you know, as a woman to woman, we kind of talked and uh, Jay-Z and Johnny talked and then they took photographs together and that kind of thing. And uh, then we went out and saw the show. I think Johnny's real love is, is jazz and of course R&B helped put the first three kids through college. So that was a, a necessity back in the day. You couldn't say, well, I'm only going to do this because when it was presented to him, he said, okay, this is how I'm going to get to the other end, and that's what he did. Minnie Ripperton uh, was a singer from back in the, in the 70s and all, and she was very popular, and she died of breast cancer, from complications with breast cancer. And her husband, Dick Rudolph, who was a producer, he and Minnie had two children, Maya Rudolph, who is on Saturday Night Live, and she has a brother, Mark. And Dick and Minnie had quite a love affair. And he had some tracks that Minnie had left unfinished, which were recorded in 1978. And he wanted to um, do something with those. And he came to Johnny and he said to Johnny that he wanted to use these tracks and complete an album and entitle it, Love Lives Forever. So, it was your idea and Dick's idea, I believe. I believe you came to this together to um, get other musicians to participate in them. And so you approached George Benson and Peebo Bryson and Roberta Flack. There was Maxine Waters. And as a matter of fact, Stevie Wonder came in and you recorded him on harmonica. And even yourself, you've done some of the arrangements Greg Fillingaines, who is one of the big uh, uh, keyboard and band directors now as far as the Grammys are concerned, Lee Rittenauer, all of these guys came together and you had them do different parts of, of the various tracks and what have you to put it all together. And in the next studio, on one particular day, Michael Jackson was there. Michael just happened to pass the studio that we were working in. And he said, that's many. What are you guys doing? And we explained to him what we were doing. And he said, well, if I can do anything, I'd like to. And Minnie and Michael were about the same range singing-wise. Michael said, I can finish that tune. Before we knew it, we had other musicians who were coming in wanting to do something on this particular album. And that's where the title of the album came from, Love Lives Forever. That was one reason why I think uh, he's never been recognized by one uh, genre as opposed to the other because he's covered several genres of uh, music and what he has done with them. If you Wikipedia him, just put in Johnny Pate and it'll pop up, you will see this guy's legendary in the music industry and has been for decades with his beginnings in Chicago, with his connections with all the great jazz bands and leaders and others that were R&B uh, that came out of that part of the country. Uh, especially the fact that he was an A&R rep for ABC Paramount. He was also very instrumental in getting the Grammys on TV. Well, I didn't feel awestruck until I met B.B. And then B.B. was so regular, I became, I was his sister. And that's what he called me, sis. And so even though I was like, oh, this is B.B. King, he just took me in under his wing right away and we kind of laughed and joked and, and that was it. 
Quincy Jones was uh, actually, he was one of my idols. His arranging style is uh, one that was the same genre that I was down. In other words, he was one of the ones that I followed. So we got very close. If I bump into him, hey, Q, Paige, how you doing? You know, we gra gra grab a hug and uh, I don't know what his life is like, but uh, I know what mine is like. I don't, I don't, I don't really have a lot of buddy buddies, you know, in the business. I think Johnny's legacy would be humility. Um, if that encompasses kindness, then of course that goes along with it. But he is well known by so so many people for just being a kind, humble individual. For one thing, uh, I try to treat other people the way I would like to be treated. That's one thing. And the rest of it, uh, I've just been lucky, I think. Like a song I wrote, how did I get so lucky? He never discuss the war that much. He felt because uh, he was in the band, he was fortunate enough to be put into the band, that he shouldn't um, say too much about it, that he didn't actually have to fight. And I have to say, this is one of the times when I encouraged him. I said, you know, you were drafted, and you were drafted at 19 years of age. You didn't know your head from a hole in the wall. And they took you and they put a rifle in your hand and they showed you how to kill somebody. And they taught you all of these things. And then they put you on a ship. You had never been on a ship. And they sent you to a country where someone spoke a foreign language. And you had no idea what they were saying. And it, the, the army was segregated at the time. So you were with an all black regiment. And you were fortunate enough once you got there that someone had found out you had a talent. And so they enlisted you to play and keep the morale up of all of the other armed forces. And that's something you should be proud of. And you should talk about it more. I think a lot of us musicians who have been in the military have a little bit of that feeling, but you've got to remember the military is an entire community of doctors and nurses and uh, food prep and motor pool and everything you could think of. And so, not everybody needs to be on the battlefield because you've got to have support going on back behind the scenes. If we were all on the battlefield, there wouldn't be any of the other stuff available to us. So it's very important for people to understand that the musicians play a big part in the morale of the, of the troops to basically keep in the back of their mind that they're being appreciated. So since then, he has come to terms with that and he has spoken about it more. But it's kind of funny, the funny story is one lady said to me one day, she said, uh, tell us about the years that he was in the service. And I stopped and I looked at her and I said, I was only two. <laughs> <laughs> so there's not very much I can say, except that I'm very proud of him. If you can get the right partner, like I have, see, I got the right partner. And Carolyn, hey, that was really, the right partner because her being there helped drive me on to to heights. We just just work together well, and we always have. We we've been uh, partners for all these 53 plus years, and um, we love one another, and uh, we love our family. The word of wisdom is forgiveness. To forgive is to love. And no matter what goes down, you have to forgive. Don't hold any grudges, just move on. It doesn't do you any good and it doesn't do the other person any good. So I would say forgiveness. Well, the thing is, I've only been 124 hours. So I can't tell you too much from this point. Talk to me a month from now. <laughs>